Welcome back to page 121. Today we're going to take a look at Journal of Travelers Aid Society number 5. I'm going to go through these in order. So number 5 is up next, and uh, I like these JTAZs. They, they take me back to the early days of Traveler. We're going to take a look through it and see what kind of goodies are inside for you. Uh, I'll put a link to getting it and everything uh, in the description below. But uh, yeah, if you're looking for just a little bit of uh, travel reading, but uh, you don't want to read a big source book or anything. These are great because it's a bunch of different articles. You can kind of read what you want. Also, real quickly, just please subscribe if you haven't already. Take a look at the Patreon. If there's anything you can do to help out the channel, that would be fantastic. End of the commercial. Back to this. Today on page 121, Journal of Traveler's Aid Society, number five. JTAS number five from Mongoose Publishing. Uh, these JTASs were out as a Kickstarter a few years ago. They did 1 through 6 and then 7 through 12. And now you can buy, buy them individually. I did not get in on the Kickstarter. I've been buying them individually as PDFs. And Journal of Traveler's Aid Society was an old magazine from Game Designers Workshop back in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s. And it was just a variety of articles. You could jump in and, and read articles about this or that throughout the run of the magazine there they very rarely they did a, a war theme issue on issue number nine but other than that they generally bounced around on topics which i love because when i'm in the mood to read traveler but i don't feel like reading a big book or a source book or anything like that or the rules i go ahead and i crack this guy out because these are great for getting ideas so we're going to take a look at number five right now i picked this up uh it's 15 dollars for the pdf 25 for the hardcover or in for the soft cover for the print book, but the uh, I picked this up in the GM's Day sale back in March, and I think I paid eleven fifty for it. So I don't think that's too bad for PDF, and these are good quality. I don't work for Mongoose, never have, but uh, I do like their products. So here we go. We got a uh, list of the credits. These list old auth older authors and new ones because they take a lot of the articles from the original JTAS and they update them for Mongoose, which I thought was kind of cool. So we take a look. First, damage control operations. Not something that's dwelled on a lot with Traveler is how you deal with damage control. So here's some uh, rule options for you. I remember reading a version of this back in the original JTAS, and it was pretty helpful. So you have different tables for the severity of the damage, the nature of the damage, some fine artwork. There's nice artwork throughout these. And then uh, damage reporting, assessment and planning, Damage Control Operations. So this is a pretty useful article. Dealing with damage effect. So you get about seven or eight pages on damage control, which for me, for Traveler, is, is key because you're in your starship. It's your, your literal way of staying alive, and now you've got a problem with it. It's not working right. You've got to fix it through space dam or through combat damage or perhaps a rogue meteorite or some other accident, just a, an engine explosion. You've got to now fix it. We got a bestiary, the beaked monkey, or beaker. Me, 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 me. Uh, so we have the beaked monkey. There he is. Nice little animal encounter. These are not monsters. The blood vark. Because why not? <laughs> and there's the blood vark. The sea bear. I immediately jumped to one of my favorite ep episodes of uh, SpongeBob SquarePants, where he deals with the sea bear. And there's your sea bear with all eight legs. Then we go to High Guard and we get a, a good look, look at jump boats. When I was new to Traveler, jump boats were one of the things that intrigued me the most. The idea of this Pony Express style of getting information at the speed of travel really spoke to me. It's one of the things that's kept me in Traveler all these years. I really like that. So here's how we deal with jump boats. Jump boats, if you don't know, for the most part, do not have maneuver drive. They have a jump drive and a pilot. And the pilot takes the all the information download, uh, secure and un, in, unsecure, from one star system and jumps his boat to the next. And then he is picked up and the, the packet is electronically dumped to the next boat waiting in line or to system appropriate, whatever it would be. And that's how the mail gets disseminated. So this talks about the jump boats themselves. And there's a nice look at a street class, a fast courier. 
100 tons, which is the smallest you can mount a jump drive in a Traveler. Nice little pl deck plan for it. And then you get a supply boat with the high guard stats for it. Deck plan. A fuel supply boat. Again, high guard and deck plans. A shepherd picket boat. I kind of like this guy. This guy is a um, basically a small ship that would help you cover some security security in an insecure area. Uh, it has jump. It's got jump one, thrust two. That's kind of neat. So you can use it as a picket ship, which is, means it sits out where most things come in from jump, or it sits by a gas giant, or it just pickets the area on approach to the main world, and it, it runs little customs checks and other things like that. <clears throat> For Chartered Space article, we get world security profiles. How does the world operate? How does it keep its citizens safe? How does it oppress or not oppress its citizens or visitors? And this is a good look at security forces. We get law enforcement, military, and intelligence forces. Some more artwork right there. The motivations behind them, why they do what they do, how they do it. And then the security profile. And this is a good way to add some more depth to your traveler game if you're... Uh, crew is just getting off their starship and they're heading out of the starport and they're going under the local law, it's kind of neat to throw in some curves they're not expecting. Maybe the local law isn't flagged as anything, but it turns out that they dislike off-worlders. So they have a habit of stopping and harassing off-worlders. So it's just another way you can add to your game. This guy's not having a good day. And then, for, of course, if you're on a balkanized world, which is a world that is, does not have one unified government, but it has several... Uh, disparate governments, then a balkanized world can be a real challenge because the laws will change from area to area. That can be a lot of fun in Traveler. Balkanized worlds are just a blast to run. What's okay over here isn't okay over there, which is true on our own planet. And then using the security profile, adding it to the Imperial bases, starports and travel codes. I didn't like this. They did an overlay here where you can barely see the text underneath this overlay. I'm not really sure what the idea was here, but the two do not work well. I, I hope they drop that in future ones. We get an adventure, The Lost Village. Uh, after rescuing a dying stranger from the snow, the travelers try to uncover the fate of an entire village. This is a short adventure you can run. A little bit of a mystery. Uh, if you feel like wearing your Scooby-Doo clothes and going out and trying to solve what happened to this town, it's all here for you. And then there's the fate of the lost village. There's, I know I'm giving up spoilers if you read this stuff. So I guess spoiler alert. <laughs> uh, and then you get a rough terrain uh, snowmobile, an Arctic cat type thing. Traveling, fasten your seatbelts. Landing difficulty. Again, we didn't get a ton of nuts and bolts for how to deal with your starships in the original Traveler. So these kind of articles were gold. So how you landed is an ordinary landing. Is there some problem? Is it a tight landing? Is there tremendous wind shear? Rock ball landings where there's very little gravity. Landing in an atmosphere. And then we get an alien look at the Verushi. I love the Verushi. These are big, big boys, but they're gentle giants. And that's where they hail from right there. The equipment and vehicles, Verushi Travelers. The only problem with Verushi Travelers is generally you're non-violent. I know that sounds a weird thing for me to say, but let's face it, conflict is what drives Traveler. Uh, being a pacifist in Traveler can make for interesting role-playing, but I'm not sure I want to play a character that's a, a pacifist. The High Guard for Ganser Tender. This is uh, basically a tugboat in space. I kind of like this guy. This guy's more than a tugboat, actually. He can tender you from one system to another. He's got jump two. So if you have those system defense boats that have mount no jump, or if you are damaged and need to get from this port to that port to be repaired, you could hire the Ganser Tender and he'll take you there. There's the high guard stats for it and the deck plan. It is a dispersed frame, which means it's kind of spider-like where everything attaches on and then it feels, fills, covers them in a jump bubble and off you go. So I just I thought this was a pretty neat idea. I had an idea for a game where the players have a quote crippled unquote ship because they really want to steal the tender for whatever reason, or there's something they believe is aboard the tender. So they uh, are aboard their ship, and then the question becomes, is there communication between their ship and the tender, or are the two completely isolated? That's really up for the GM to set up. 
So it's just an idea I had. There's the roles and variants for it, for the ship. Then we go to Chartered Space Salvage Rights. Salvage Rights are still a thing in Traveler uh, that varies on the edition and varies by the author. Salvage Rights are very tricky, but they can be a ton of fun. If you are, your players have been playing Hard Scrabble for a long, long time and they're living paycheck to paycheck and you sense a little fatigue on their part, which happens. Sometimes you give them a win and that win can be a lost ship found in space that they recover and they gain salvage rights too. So it's a good way to give them cash if they need it. You can't always have the characters be downtrodden because there will come a point where they'll get tired of it and they won't want to do it anymore. So you've got ownership and salvaging rights, re-registering. Everybody thinks you can just jump aboard this abandoned ship, uh, fix it up a little bit so it's jump capable and now it's yours. That's not how it works. And beautiful artwork there. That's my favorite piece out of the out of the book. And that's not how it works. So you want to take a good look at this. There's good charts in there, how to make money doing it. Are you a salvage company? Some great art uh, ads for Halberd, uh, Salvage and Rescue, and the Jace Group. We get a ground vehicle, the Unified Mobile Solutions F500 Field Power Unit. This thing's pretty cool. It's kind of an, a multi-use heavy vehicle. It's got the crane on it, but it also produces power very cheaply. So you can use it to power up the area where you're working. Again, they've got that little corner thing. I don't know what that was. I wonder if that's something in my tablet where it's just not populating right. I don't know. If you know, please let me know in the comments because I don't like that. And then we have the, the adventure Chariots of Fire. You've got to steal a couple of fire trucks from one part of a balkanized world and drive them across the border to another part of the balkanized world. Seth Skorkowski took a look at this adventure. He'd run it a year or two ago, and he took a look at it in his channel. So if you want to see it, I recommend taking a look at Chariots of Fire. I have not run it. Uh, I don't think my guys would be real interested in this type of mission. So I, I don't intend to run it anytime soon, but Seth did a nice job with it. There you go. And there's the truck itself, what they're stealing. And then advanced fire engines, there's the other one. There's two that they're taking, and these are the two brought out. High guard, we get towing ships. So we're staying kind of on a salvage theme with a towing ship. If your ship is, your M drive is damaged, and you're, you know, two days out from the main world, then you're going to have to call for a tow. We've all been there. So you call for the tow, you take the craft under tow, you attach the tow lines. The physical towing, the dangers involved, and there can be many. And then a towing pod, where we get a nice high guard look. One thing I love about the EGJ is you always get some kind of ship in it. And very often they're uh, unusual ships, which is what I like. And then we get traveling, calling out the guard. Again, security forces. So what is the guard? What are they protecting? Why do they protect it? Are they routine skill, uh, a response unit, or an elite personnel unit? An organization in size? With some very Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. looking artwork there. And the equipment they might have, how competent they are, whether they're corrupt or not. You can be competent but still be corrupt. Your incident response. And then you got a, a nice example of Flatsburg. It's a town where the security reigns. And then we have for charted space, extremophiles. These are creatures that don't live in an ordinary environment, what we think of as an ordinary environment. They live in exotic environments. Uh, the peak tangler lives in a thin atmosphere world and spread over the centuries to many systems. And they're just a nuisance more than anything else, but they may or may not grow large enough to be somewhat, uh, sci or somewhat conscious and have some intelligence. That's an interesting idea. ARCs, what exactly the ARC stands for uh, is a matter of some debate. Uh, and the Arx is a space-going creature that resembles asteroids. I always like these too. I don't use a ton of space monsters in uh, my Traveler game, but it can be interesting. Then we got the Sargasso Hive. I, I misspoke, by the way. The the net, the Peak Tangler, is not the thing that can grow in size to become somewhat sentient. It's the Sargasso Hive. Uh, they are gigantic floating clusters of what appear to be seaweed, however, contains primitive neutrons, and when you get enough of it, it starts actually forming a brain. And it has low-grade psionics to lure prey in and things like that. So a good game you can make is just 
the players find an interdicted world or a world that's not interdicted but it's outside the Imperium that is covered in the Sargasso Hive and there's all kinds of problems being caused by the psionic partially intelligent seaweed or high seaweed yeah then we had central supply iiss field equipment i love field equipment especially for the scouts so here we go outfits and genetic generic wear genetic wear would be interesting we get field dress translation analysis unit i love stuff like this in traveler field glasses uh section two field scanners and detectors you get a weapon scanner and a biochemical sampler scanner, a medical scanner. This is also useful for travel or whatever game you're playing. So I was really excited. I know there are analogs to this throughout Central Supply Catalog and the base rulebook and things, but I still like this kind of stuff in JTAS. And then we get an encounter with Ramon Senarvo. He's a qualified master pilot, qualified second officer, and he's a master pilot, but he's fallen on hard times through having his name slammed and he can't get hired, so he's turned to crawl inside a bottle. So, interesting character, good role-playing opportunities there. Charted space, we get to the black market, along with your salvage. Now maybe we're dealing with the black market a little bit. Black market is where you're selling things illegally, uh, beyond the reach of the law. Social and moral unacceptability, controller financial, controls restrictions and bans. Finding a supplier, so if you need those anagathics because you are on anagathics and you've run out by mistake, you have to find a black marketeer. Maybe he'll sell them to you. It's, it's what you've got to do. So black market contacts, these are just so much fun. Buying and selling different things. You could be a gun smuggler, whatever you want to do. And then the base price and how much you can get for it when you fence it or if you become the fence. And high guard, we get a nice space combat primer. This takes the somewhat cinematic rules for Traveler's Space Combat and breaks them down a little bit cleaner. It's still cinematic, but it's a little easier to understand even than what's in the rule book. Uh, I did like this. I've read this now a couple times because I'm going to be honest, Traveler's Space Combat as written has never gripped me because again, it's very cinematic. Uh, you don't have any ships moving versus ships per se on a tabletop. You can do it all narratively. Uh, I've always looked for other more dynamic ways to do space combat. And there's the attack, the damage, called shots, actions that you can take, and that's the end of the book. So as you see, you get quiet a bit in this little book. And uh, kind of on theme with uh, salvage and just kind of underhanded, under-the-table stuff. But still, it's really good. It's not a completely themed issue. There's plenty of other things in there. So like I say, when I'm not in the mood to read a heavy role-playing, I turn to the Journal of the Traveler's Aid Society so I can just read myself a variety of articles and find something that, that interests me for that day. So there you have it. I hope you liked it. Please let me, let me know what you thought. I will put links below to Mongoose's site and to DriveThru where you can get your hands on this. And uh, that's all I've got today. So and thank you for having, uh, taking the time and spending time with me. And I'll see you next time on page 121.